Good evening, folks, with Multiply, whenever I was praying there, so it's good to have you with us. Uh, I want to do a bit of a recap, uh, remind you where things have been. In First Thessalonians, we weren't in Thessalonians last week, and it was a joy to have Phil with us, um, discussing our, our, our partnership in the gospel uh, across Europe and uh, through EMF. Well, in Acts chapter 16, it was Europe that was the centre of Paul's ministry. Or should I say, Paul went to Europe and made it the centre of his ministry. In Acts 16, you'll remember that Paul had a dream and he saw a man from Macedonia calling to him. And so he was guided by the Holy Spirit to head for the first time into the continent of Europe. Paul entered Europe, began at Philippi, where we know he planted a church, and we have a letter to the Philippians to teach us about that church. And he went about preaching the gospel from there. After Philippi, he came to Thessalonica. And you'll remember Thessalonica was a wealthy, it was an important port city. It was an intersection of trade routes, uh, both by sea and by land. And Paul was only there a very short time. He he preached for three Sabbaths in a row. And then he caused a row among the local Jews. Uh, what happened was there were those who were interested in Judaism who would hang around the synagogue and would listen to the teaching. And whenever they heard Paul teach, they were much more interested in Christianity than they were in Judaism. And so they converted to Christianity and the local Jews were incensed by this. They caused an uproar, a riot. Uh, the, the house of, of Jason, where Paul seems to have been staying, was, uh, was attacked. <clears throat> Jason was thrown in prison, but after paying bail, he was let out of prison. And the Christians, who were new converts, decided it was no longer safe for Paul and Silas and Timothy to remain in Thessalonica and so they were uh, taken out of the city by night. After there, from there, sorry, I should say, uh, Paul and his companions went on to Berea, and they had a great reception at Berea. The, the church in Berea uh, really loved the scriptures and loved hearing what Paul was teaching them. And from Berea, they went on to Athens. Paul went on ahead to Athens, and he was followed shortly by Silas and Timothy. Athens as a, a city, uh, well, it's the centre of the ancient world. It's the place where all of the philosophers came to. It's where the universities were established. It's where people thought about all the ideas that were coming up in the world at the time. It was a hotbed of philosophy, all of the, the, the thinking, where, where people went to think and to debate and to argue for their own point. And we know that Paul, well, he found some sort of hearing in Athens, but it was a difficult place for the gospel. People thought they were above the gospel. They thought they were too smart for the gospel. And it was a hard place for Paul to minister. And it's in Athens that we find Paul in our passage tonight in First Thessalonians, uh, starting us at chapter 2. I think uh, before we come to read the passage, um, let me just say as a bit of an aside, it's good, isn't it, to, to see that the story of Acts and the writings of Paul in the New Testament, it's good to see that they make sense of each other. Now, I think it's, it's a helpful confirmation for us that these two books or, or, or two sets of writings in the New Testament they are genuine, real events in the history of the world, and they match up with each other. Two different accounts, Paul's writings and the, the writings of Luke, they, they match up. The same names, the same people are being mentioned alongside the same places. And it makes me incredibly thankful for the reliability of God's word in all truth. Sometimes we, we think about the Bible as only teaching us spiritual truth, and we're going to think about the spiritual reality of things tonight. 
But God's word teaches us truth in terms of history as well. It teaches us what actually happened in the history of the world. And I think that's a great confirmation to us that we can trust it. Well, in the past few weeks, we've been thinking through what it means to be a Christian. What does a Christian look like? And we've seen from this book of Thessalonians that for the early church, through the example of the Thessalonians, and as well as the example of Paul personally, a Christian is someone who believes things about God and puts those things into action. Someone who's, whose life has been changed by the impact of the gospel. It changes the way they live. And the difference is noticeable to everybody who can see them. The gospel makes a difference in people's lives. So remember we said they, they don't just have faith. They have a faith that works. They don't just love. They labour in love. And they don't just have a vague hope in their hearts and minds. It actually impacts them. It makes them patient in the way that they live their lives, waiting for the return of Christ. That's what we saw the Thessalonians look like. And in chapter 2, we saw it's the same for Paul. Paul's life matches his doctrine. What he believes impacts the way he lives. And then Paul encouraged the Thessalonians in, in some of the suffering they were facing. In fact, Paul told them that in the suffering they were undergoing, they were joining in the pattern of the Christian faith. Because Paul himself suffered. The churches in Jerusalem were suffering. The prophets of the Old Testament suffered. And even Jesus himself suffered to bring us into the kingdom of God. So suffering is the way of the Christian life. And it's in this connection of, of how we are all united in the church, one body under Christ, that we're going to see tonight. Because what we see in this letter is that Paul loves the local church. Paul loves the local church. Let's read together, if you have your Bibles there, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. And starting reading at verse 17. And we'll read right through to the end of chapter 3. This is God's word. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow labourer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it happened, and you know, for this reason... When I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labour might be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now, May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase 
and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. We thank God for his truth. The passage splits neatly, I think, into four paragraphs. The first is Paul writing about his longing to be with the Thessalonians. That is the last few verses of chapter 2. And remember that Paul wasn't with them for very long, and so there's probably lots of things that he still wanted to teach them. He only had three weeks. He couldn't have told them everything he wanted them to know. He wants to work through difficult things with them. He wants to talk to them about the Christian faith. Even if you scan down to verse 10 of chapter 3, you can see that Paul prays that he will get to see them so that he can perfect what is lacking in their faith. I just think that means that he wants to clear up any questions they might have. He wants to sit with them. He wants to, to talk into the wee small hours of the morning, talking with them about Jesus. What a joy it is to do that. But as we read through verses 17 to 20 of chapter 2, don't we just get this huge sense of affection? How Paul loves the Thessalonians. His longing to be with them is genuine. And he knows that if he was able to be there, he would be an encouragement to them and they would be an encouragement to him. See how he says he, his heart is with them. He's not with them in presence, but his heart is with them. He has a great desire to see their faces. He calls them his joy, his hope, his crown and glory. But he's been prevented. He's been prevented from going to them time and time again. Paul says this is of Satan. And we're not told the earthly reasons why. Whether it was simply that they, um, he, he couldn't afford it. or We, we don't know the, the reason why. It, it might have been the commotion that there had been between him and the Jews when he was in Thessalonica. And he was worried that that would return if he returned to Thessalonica. Either way, this section from chapter 2, I think, sets the tone for the rest of chapter 3. The main thing I want you to hear tonight is that Paul loves the local church. His heart is with the local church. He desires the good of the local church. He prays for the local church. And so when we think about what a Christian looks like, it's somebody who loves the local church. I want to illustrate why I'm using those words specifically. I think it's something we know in our own minds already. Think about the pandemic that we're still going through, the coronavirus pandemic. When things started to get bad last March and April, well, it was distressing, wasn't it, to see that people were getting very sick and to see that many people were dying. But as bad as that felt, it came home to us, especially when someone we knew was affected. When someone we knew personally caught the virus or someone we knew became sick. Maybe we even lost a loved one. Maybe somebody we know lost a loved one. And all of a sudden, didn't it feel more real? It felt closer to us. It was a distant threat whenever it was in China, whenever it was in Italy. And so that's why I speak here of Paul's love for the local church. It's not a love in general. It's not a general love for the church. And, and he does have a love for the church in general. But the church is made up of human beings, people with individual personalities. And that's what Paul is longing for here in these verses. Let me put it another way. Last week, we heard about the church as it is now, 2,000 years after Paul first brought the gospel into Europe. 
We heard about the church in Europe, especially in Spain. And I was struck by the, the seeming hopelessness of, of all of the challenges that are facing our church across the whole continent. About the growth of secularism and superstition around Christianity in Spain. While we long to see the growth and the increase of the church, it's hard to talk about that in, in general. Just about the church, we want to see the growth of the church. It's hard to feel the love and compassion that perhaps we should feel for the bride of Christ. But the church is not a thing. The church are the people of God. The church is made up of people. And so when Phil started talking last week about a specific church, about a specific congregation of the church in Almenecker, the Lopez family, when he put names and faces, when he told us of, of what they were doing in that church, I know that my heart started to warm. All of a sudden, I, I felt compassion, I felt love, I felt longing for the people in Almenecker. So as we learned about the human beings who make up the Church of Christ in that place, who they are and what they're doing, all of a sudden it becomes real to us. And our hearts long for the church. We love the local church. And that's how it was for Paul with the Thessalonians. He knew them. He knew their names. He knew their faces. He cared deeply for them. But what is it that he wants for them? What does Paul want for the Thessalonians? What is it we should want for the church of Christ? Well, that comes to the front in the next two sections. We'll take the next two sections together. Verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3 talk about Paul sending Timothy to the Thessalonians. And then verses 6 to 10 talk about Timothy's return back to Paul and what Paul learns about the Thessalonians. In this section, we learn more about what a Christian looks like. And it is that a Christian is someone who cares about and is comforted by the faith of others. Isn't that interesting? Look at some of the ways that Paul seems to be concerned about the Thessalonians. First two of chapter three, he says he sent Timothy to Thessalonica to establish them and encourage them in their faith. His longing for the Thessalonians went way beyond, I hope you're doing well. He missed them in a way that is much deeper than simply missing the fellowship or the banter that he might have with them. It's not just about wanting to see them and have a cup of tea. He longed for them to be strong in the Lord, to have a deep and rooted Christian faith. His longing for the local church is that they would be spiritually healthy. He goes on in the next couple of verses to speak about some of the suffering they were facing. And he connects with that because he says that he too is afflicted and in distress. His concern for them is that their faith is strong. Because their faith needs to be able to stand up against the suffering that they are facing. He hopes that the suffering is not going to become an opportunity for the devil to tempt them away from Christ. I think this is immensely helpful for us. When we hear about Christians who are suffering around the world, when we hear about someone who is suffering, what do we immediately think to pray for? I know that I immediately think to pray that their suffering would be ended. That's not what Paul prays for at all. That's not what Paul says. Look at verse 3. At the end of verse 3, Paul says, we are appointed to this. Suffering is something that Christians should expect. He doesn't say to them, I'm really sorry to hear you're going through a tough time. He doesn't say, I hope it will be over soon. He says, you should have been expecting this. Christians are appointed to suffer and I hope that your faith remains strong through the suffering. Isn't that a great mindset 
for Paul to have. It's a kingdom mindset. It's a mindset that says the things of this world are temporary and they are fleeting. But faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is of everlasting benefit. It's a mindset that says that's what's important. Other things are important in our lives, but that's what's most important. We could pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, even in our own country, who are suffering. And we could ask that their suffering would end. Or we could pray, like Paul, that their suffering would strengthen their faith and that they would be able to endure that they wouldn't be able, that they wouldn't um, be, be tempted to fall away from the Christian faith. Paul sent Timothy to see how the Thessalonians were doing, but it wasn't just their physical well-being he was interested in. He knew they would be suffering. He wanted to know about their spiritual well-being. How is their faith? I wonder is that how we might be able to talk to one another? How's your faith? How's your Christian faith today? Is that what we want to know about each other? Is that how we spend our time talking with one another? What's giving you encouragement at the minute? What's discouraging you? Then look at verses 7 and 8. Paul says, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Again, what a great mindset to have. Paul's whole life is enhanced when Timothy returns and he reports the Thessalonians are strong in the faith. They are standing strong in the Lord. Paul says, now we have life. We have life if they are standing strong in the Lord. It begs the question of us, what is our comfort? Paul was comforted by knowing the Thessalonians were standing firm in the Lord. He's undergoing his own affliction. Athens, like I said, was a hard place for the gospel to take root, let alone for the gospel to bear fruit. And so Paul is delighted to hear how the Thessalonians are doing. What is your comfort and joy in this world? Does it come from seeing the strong faith of other people? I hope it does. And what about flipping the question? Who are you encouraging? Who are you being an encouragement to when you stand firm in the Lord? Maybe you don't even realise that you're doing that still important. I've said before to the young people, you, you realise how many people's prayers are answered when they see you standing firm in Christ. When we see young people in worship participating in the life of the church, in the life of the fellowship. It's the same for older folks. The older folks are an encouragement to the young people by living out their Christian faith, by demonstrating the Christian faith for everyone to see. Paul says, now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. How many people are living because you are standing fast in the Lord? Well, this theme continues into the last of our sections, verses 11 to 13. We read one of the many prayers that Paul offers in the letter to the Thessalonians, he offers many prayers in the New Testament. We see that a Christian is someone who prays for the good of the local church. Look at Paul's prayer. I'm always convicted about my own prayer life whenever I read Paul's prayers. Um, Paul was an apostle, I'm not an apostle. But two things strike me here. First of all, Paul is outward looking in his prayers. He prays for the good of others. Even his prayer for himself is that he would get to go and be with the Thessalonians. That his way would be directed to them. This is the kingdom mindset 
It's part of his love for the local church. But I'm also struck by the content of his prayer for them. He prays that they would be built up in love. He prays that their hearts would be established as blameless and excuse me, and unholy before God. Again, his concerns are not for the things of this world. That's not saying that the things of this world are unimportant, but Paul has a heavenly and eternal mindset that puts the things of this world into their proper context. So his concern is for their spiritual well-being. His concern is for their Christian faith. His concern is that they would grow in holiness so that when Christ returns, they are ready because their hearts are blameless. I think we could all, especially me, we could all do with a little more of Paul's type of praying in our own prayer lives. Maybe it would help us think less about the concerns of this world and more about the eternal glory that outweighs everything in this world. What does a Christian look like? A Christian is someone who loves the local church. A Christian is someone who cares about and is comforted by the faith of those in the local church. And a Christian is someone who prays for the good of the local church. Let me pray now for us.